Our unison scripture reading this morning is an unusual reading from the book of Numbers. And let us seek God's spirit to understand and apply the reading. God, give us wisdom, give us insight, give us stamina and courage as we seek to follow you guided by your word. May this example and our other readings bring us hope and confidence in Christ our Lord. Amen. So read with me Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, but the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze, put it upon a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now the story continues from John's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Jesus speaking to the people. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and the people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is right and true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The word of the Lord. One year ago today, we started the shutdown. Can you believe it? COVID hit last March. We began canceling services and limiting things. And we remember thinking, gosh, this could last, what, two, maybe three months? Who knew? And we went 28 weeks not worshiping together, merely recording. So we're turning the corner. Things are coming around. Vaccinations, of course, consume our attention these days. We're trying to get our COVID vaccination to protect our our own health and to protect those around us and to try to bring this thing to an end if we can. We're tired of this pandemic and we wonder when things will ever return to normal or what the new normal is going to be. And our medical teams and researchers have done amazing work, have they not? providing the things we need, discovering what we need, bringing uh, vaccines to the forefront. Thank God for our healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, researchers, technicians, all the people working behind the scenes to give us what we need to restore our health. I'm intrigued what a vaccine is and what it does, that you take a small dose of the virus that's potentially deadly, you inject it into the body of a healthy person, and their immune system begins to attack the virus and to defeat it and build up immunity so that if the virus tries to attack you again, it'll be less able to do so. The thing that threatens you, that could kill you, is the very thing that saves you. 
Now hold that thought and consider what's happening in this story in Numbers 21. Moses and the Israelites are in the desert years after their freedom from Egypt, still wandering, still on their journey to the promised land, and they're tired, they're weary. They see no end of the journey, and they've begun to complain. They're whining, and they're just murmuring, murmuring. There's no food, there's no water, and we hate this miserable food. After years of manna, manna soup, manna casserole, manna pancakes, manna pie, manna helper, they've had it. They've had enough and they're complaining against Moses. And why did you bring us out here anyway? It may have been bad, but at least we had food and we had water in Egypt. Did you bring us out here in the wilderness to die? They've been complaining ever since they left Egypt, but now they complain against God. They knew better than to complain against God. After all, they had witnessed God's mighty acts and power numerous times as they came out of Egypt. God had miraculously saved and protected them and cared for them time and time again. He sent the plagues to cause the Egyptians to free them. At the Red Sea, God parted the waters and let them cross on dry land to safety on the other side. At, At Sinai, they witnessed thunder and shaking and lightning when God spoke to them. He led them as a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. And when the people wanted meat, God sent quail. When there was no water for miles around, God spoke, Moses spoke, the rock split and water came forth. God gave them victory over the Canaanites at Hormah. They're close to the promised land. And in spite of all this, they still turned their back and complained against God and Moses. They just conveniently forgot all those good things God had done for them, and they're murmuring. And in a moment of disgust, as if they just threw away the privilege of being the people of God. Next thing you know, poisonous snakes appear. Did they just pick the wrong route and walked into this, or did God send them People are dying from the snake bites, and I think they realized they had crossed the line in their complaining. And as with us, it's only after the punishment that they expressed regret and apologize. Maybe we, should, we shouldn't have been so hasty to complain against God, you think? And so they come back to Moses again. We, we sinned when we spoke against God and you. Please pray that God will take these snakes away from us. And Moses prayed to God for the people. He acted as an intercessor. He interceded for Israel before God's throne and asked God to save them, forgive them. He, we see in Moses' example our great intercessor, Jesus Christ, who when we sin goes to God's throne and prays for our forgiveness. And God, being the God who frees, who who heals and provides, does help them. Even though God expects trust and obedience from his people, and he does not take kindly to repeatedly being dismissed, questioned, forgotten, God still helps God is still faithful to his covenant promise. So when God's people are in danger, God reaches out with compassion and he makes healing possible. He tells Moses to make a serpent out of bronze and put it on a pole, hold it up, and if anyone's bitten by a serpent, all they have to do is look at the poisonous serpent on the pole and they're going to be healed. How, How ironic this method of healing. The very thing that harms you now becomes the thing that heals you. Kind of like a COVID vaccine. On many medical facilities and and products and and on ambulances, you'll see a caduceus. Caduceus is an ancient symbol for healing. Doctors, it's, it's two serpents wrapped around a staff and they have wings at the top. 
It dates back to Mesopotamia and the God who cured illness. And it's a symbol for medical care, this caduceus, because of the confusion with a traditional medical symbol, the rod of Asclepius, which the Roman god Asclepius, excuse me, the Greek god, it was the deity that was associated with healing and medicine. And that symbol only had one snake wrapped around the shaft. And when the Americans got a hold of that, they confused the two symbols and they chose the two snakes with the wings at the top, which the messenger, <coughs> the messenger often carried with a message for the king. Mercury is portrayed as carrying a caduceus, a rod, the shepherd, the staff. So this symbol that only had one snake has now become confused with the others, but we've had it so long they don't want to change the logo back. The healing power. It's somewhat tied back to the story of Moses and the Exodus and this healing serpents. The healing power of the bronze serpent on the pole is rooted in God's power to heal. Please understand the people were not healed by looking at the snake. It was the symbol on the top of the staff to point them to God who heals. The power of salvation rested not in the snake but in the God above. It was God who saved the children of Israel. And he did so by his own grace and our faith to look to him. What then was the bronze snake? It was a symbol, a reminder. And how strange it seems to me that God would provide the serpents and then provide the people with the means to cure those who were bitten. But isn't that like a God of justice and grace? He did not desire that any should perish, but that all might be healed, all might be saved. We see that again in John's gospel. God sent his son into the world not to condemn, but to save the world. And this bronze serpent, it's a peculiar story. Very confusing, even the commentators admit. But the Jews in the days of Jesus knew the story. It was part of their Hebrew lore. And it was a story about hope and about healing and about salvation. So it's not surprising that Jesus told the story. But he doesn't give it any introduction. He just referred to the story as he reveals his stated purpose, which is to heal and to save the people. God makes healing possible for the people God loved. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. God came into the world to make healing possible. And Jesus knew the story of the serpents, and his Hebrew listeners knew the story, and he knew that they knew that he knew the story. So when Jesus simply refers to it, he's, he makes no explanation, he just makes a comparison. And like when Moses made the serpent and lifted up on a pole, so must the Son of God be lifted up, which we know is Jesus on the cross. He puts his listeners in a position to hear the big truth he's about to reveal. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. God sent Jesus into the world with the intention of healing and saving us not to harm us, not to condemn us. Yes, there's still judgment. It points out the reality of sin and the remedy for sin. God is a just God, and God demands justice for his own holy code. But in Jesus Christ, God is not interested in condemnation, just as God did not want the Israelites to die in the wilderness. So God does not want us to die, but to live. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. John 3, 17, the next verse. God is faithful to his promise, his covenant, to provide and to protect us and to save us. Our response is we promise to be God's people and to do as he taught us. So Jesus said, look at me and do as I do. Sometimes it's simple, 
Sometimes it's not. But Jesus is the son of the covenanting God. And more than just carrying on the work and the purpose of the covenant, Jesus ups the ante on us. The people of the wilderness covenant, bitten by the serpents, just had to look at the bronze serpent and they'd be healed. We are called not just to look at Jesus, but to believe in him if we want to be saved and to live like Jesus, to show our thanks in obedience. Do as I do, said Jesus. Our part of the covenant, this final salvation, this eternal life that offers us in Jesus, is to believe and to follow. It's not just believing with your mind and assenting to a truth. It is believing it so hard, so real in your heart. You cannot but change and do what is right and follow him. Believing in Jesus means living like Jesus. It it means having the mind of Jesus, looking at others with Jesus' eyes and to see and to understand who they are and what they're going through. It's accepting strangers and outcasts. It's choosing not to commit our old sins anymore, but to live in the newness of life. It means standing up for justice It means putting a plate of hot food and a cup of cold water before the homeless at Loaves and Fishes and other places that we may. It's it's, uh, welcoming the newcomer at church and welcoming them into the family. And it's helping your classmate being picked on and bullied and ridiculed. It's the hard sayings that make it hard for us to follow the simple directions. Jesus brings eternal life, and that is not defeated by the miseries of the wilderness or by the pandemic. The life Jesus gives cannot be defeated by hatred or or by racism or by condemnation or injustice. They harm the life we live, but it cannot defeat it because the love of Christ is stronger. The life Jesus brings exalts the power of compassion and the word of truth, of help, of healing, And so isn't it tragic that the human family through the ages has been harmed by so much hatred and violence? And it's so needless if we only realize that all are children of God and God wants none to perish. So I was intrigued by a story told by Michael Linval about his friend Fuad Bottom. Fuad Bottom was a Christian pastor in Beirut, Lebanon, during the Arab-Israeli War of the 1980s. In 1983, the Israeli army invaded Lebanon, and there was rumor that Israel was planning a prolonged siege of Beirut, and so members of Fuad's church began to buy up all the canned food they could in order to stockpile it, in order to survive. And they were hoarding life's essentials, just as we did when the pandemic first hit us, hoarding everything, not knowing when you could get back to the store. Their fears were justified. West Beirut was totally cut off. And so the official body of the church met to decide how to distribute this food they had gathered. Two proposals were put on the table. First, they would distribute the food to all the members of the church and then to other Christians in the community. And if there was any food left, to their Muslim neighbors. The second proposal was, first they would give their food to their Muslim neighbors, and then to other Christians in the community, and then at the last, any leftover would be distributed in the church. Their meeting lasted six hours of debate. And he writes, it ended when an older, quiet, much respected elder, a woman, stood up and said, if we do not demonstrate Christian love in this place, who will? And with that, the second motion passed. They distributed the food to the Muslim neighbors first. How many Christian congregations in our land would be so different and our community would be so different if we could be so magnanimous too? If we do not demonstrate the love of Jesus in this place, who will? What a challenge to the church in a time of such hatred and division. 
And God established his covenant with us before we ever dare ask. Jesus assault us yet when sent yet sinners and died to reconcile us to God. And God raised him from the dead to give us eternal life before we even knew to ask. The bronze snake as a symbol of salvation pointed forward to Jesus Christ who was lifted up on the cross. And the Israelites had to turn their eyes to the bronze serpent to be healed. We must look at the man of faith lifted up on the cross. If we would be delivered from our sin, from death, even from Satan. And just as Israel was totally helpless to do anything about the deadly poison around them in the desert, so we are totally helpless to do anything about sin Only the Son of Man lifted up on the cross has the antidote and is able to save us from sin so that we might be victorious. Only when we look up to him lifted up are we delivered. So one other story, Webb Garrison, author of White House Ladies, talked about Lucy Hayes, the wife of Rutherford B. Hayes, the 19th president of our United States. In 1864, Lucy Hayes received word that her husband, who was a colonel in the Union Army in the Civil War, was killed in action. But on the same day, she got another telegram that said he was only wounded, not dead, badly injured during a battle in Virginia. She didn't know what to think. Was he alive? Was he dead? Communication lines were unreliable at that point. So whether he was dead or alive, she determined to bring her husband home, so she set out on a journey through the war-torn territory to find him. And for two weeks, Lucy Hayes searched battlefields and makeshift hospitals until finally, two weeks after she left home, she found her husband, injured but alive. When he campaigned for the presidency years later, Rutherford B. Hayes told the audiences of his loving wife, Lucy Hayes, who risked her own life, as he said, wandering all over kingdom come in search of her husband's corpse, only to be surprised by finding him alive and kicking. Imagine God wandering all over kingdom come to bring us home, to bring us into a loving relationship with him. And that's what God did. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. But whosoever believed in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. So how's it going with you? Chances are, not only in this pandemic and the tough times we've been through, but before you're through with this life, you're going to face hardships and distress and confusion. Have you developed that relationship with God that will give you the confidence that you need and the strength that you need and the trust that you need to endure any burden, any distress, any challenge, any heartache, any, and, and let you be victorious over evil? God wants that intimate relationship with you. It makes no difference where you come from, who you are, what you've done. God wants to have that relationship with you. He wants to be closer to you than any friend you've ever known and to give your heart what no one else can give. For God so loved you, he gave his only begotten son for you, that if you believe in him, you will not perish, but you'll have everlasting life. God wants a personal relationship with you. All you have to do is open your heart and invite him in. Look to Jesus, lift it up on the cross, And be healed, my friends. Be healed. God, we thank you for your love and grace in Christ our Lord. Help us to have the courage to follow and to be your people to the glory of Christ our Lord. Amen.